Hello, everyone, and welcome. As always, it is a pleasure to have you here. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Merlin Rothfeld, the Senior Director at Online Trading Academy. Now, Merlin has been an active trader since 1996. As one of the first students of the Academy, he took his expertise to Europe, where he's built financial trading with training materials, excuse me, for banks, brokerages, and universities, including the first ever trading lab in Europe. His, exper his experience ranges from long-term investing to short-term high-volume trading, and he trades stocks, options, futures, Forex, and cryptocurrency. He's here today to share some of his expertise with us. So to our live audience, please type any questions that you have into the chat box. Time permitting, we'll see if we can get to a couple at the end. All right, Merlin, with all that said, I will hand the mic on over to you. I'll be here if you need me, but the floor is all yours. Thank you so much for the wonderful introduction and uh, thanks to The Money Show for allowing me to be here today. Always fun uh, giving presentations, sharing knowledge and information with all of you. So yes, as she just mentioned, Please type in questions. Let me know as we go along kind of what, what you agree with, disagree with, questions you might have on the topic because it is fairly revolutionary. So uh, I'm going to try to get as much of this in as I can in the next 30 minutes because that's my allotted time. So let's just kick things off and start talking about the pros and cons of the FedNow program and CBDCs because it's the evolution of money that we are in the process of seeing right now. Now, I apologize because I my next graphic is a little comical. Well, let me get my introduction first. You can have my email if you want. It's Merlin at OTHQ if you have questions after this. Um, as she said, I've been 27 years of trading experience in just about any asset class you can imagine. I also host a, a live daily show on YouTube if you're interested in that. It's called Trader Merlin. Um, my initial graphic here, it's comical simply because I, I wanted to illustrate the evolution process of how we send money back and forth, right? How do we move money from one bank to another? Because that sets the foundation for where we are today. 1913, we all know Federal Reserve was created. It was archaic at the time, but it served its purpose. We move forward five years, and then they set up a thing called the Fedwire system, which now allowed these banks to actually send money back and forth to each other. That's crazy. That's kind of like building a toilet and waiting five years to put a hole in it, right? Your, your banks, you should send money back and forth, but let's not rehash the past. So in 1918, that Fedwire system was created. Now, we have to move forward 54 years before we saw one piece of innovation from the financial system with regards to how they send money back and forth. So to me, crazy to think that 54 years pass of all this innovation, but they finally came out with ACH, which stands for Automated Clearinghouse, and I'll explain what that is in just a second. Then our next major innovation took another 45 years. So over the course of literally 99 years, they only had two technological innovations with how we send money back and forth. Crazy to think because how you drive a car now has so much innovation now that 100 years, I mean, we'd be flying. Anyway, uh, that's when we went to real-time payments, what's called RTP. And the next step, which I'm excited about because I'm a big believer in digital assets, is going to be the FedNow program, which should be rolled out by the end of July. So within the next couple of weeks, this should be implemented. So let me look at just a real quick overview of the different types of systems so you understand why the Fed now is so important and timely with regards to its release. Every one of these innovations brought together certain advantages for us. And of course, us as the consumer, both transferring money or sending uh, money to governments or businesses or just individuals, the faster, more efficient that becomes, the better for you and I. So the initial one here. I had an ACH, which again stands for Automated Clearing House. This is what you might use to send money from you know, your bank to a, a trading account you might have. In case of cryptocurrency, you would ACH from your checking into your crypto accounts and vice versa. Those payments, typically up to $1.50 for the transaction, may take two to three business days to do that. You have a debit and credit, meaning you can actually send money to somebody and also pull money from people. So there's that push and pull mechanism for how that money is sent. Uh, and pretty much every bank in the U.S. has that now. You also have same-day ACH, which does everything as the other one did, but you have to pay more money for that, up to about five bucks, depending on the institution. So really, that was one of the best systems we had. You also have the wire transfer system, which again uses the Fed wire created in 1918. Not a lot of innovation there. Those are expensive, costly, 15 to 50 bucks. If you're going internationally, it's even more money. So in my mind, personally, kind of annoying that wires still exist. What's the point? You could use other mechanisms. Uh, this was also just a credit piece, meaning you could send money to somebody but not pull money out of someone's account. 
Then we get to the real-time payments. Now, this was a huge innovation because what it did is basically have instant settlement to transactions. The problem is that only a few banks are using this system. So it doesn't really benefit the average person. It benefits banks, right? The bigger institutions, but not necessarily the retail end like you and me. Now, those transactions, instantaneous, which is great, but again, it's really reserved for, reserved for the big banks. Uh, that was also just a credit function where I could send money to somebody, but not pull money out of your account and up to $1. And this is where we get the innovation. Fed now took its its model from current payment networks that we have established in our marketplace. So when you look at things like Venmo or Zelle or PayPal, they're doing exactly what the Fed now program is trying to do. It's a much faster settlement process. In this case, the cost is the same, right? They're actually, depending on the numbers that you look at, because they haven't defined the pricing exactly, uh, it's going to be very cheap to do this. But instant settlement, which of course is what we want, right? Instant real-time results. It's a debit and credit. So I can send money, but also I can set up recurring payments with this as well, which would be a uh, debit function. Now, the only unknown I have here is bank coverage. We don't know exactly who's going to implement Fed now. It sounds grandiose. It sounds great. There's a lot of great reasons for it. And I'll run through a list of pros and cons here in just a second. But if, if very few banks are using it, like RTP, probably not going to be that beneficial to the average person. But I have a feeling that there'll be a push to make this a mass adoption product because it leads to the second step, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, which is going to be central bank digital currencies or CBDCs. All right, so let's just understand the difference between ACH because that's the big step that's gonna happen between our old system and hopefully what you and I can access by August 1st, which is that FedNow program. With ACH, the processing of those transactions, when you did a, uh, an ACH transfer from your checking account into your brokerage account, that's done as a batch. They don't do them individually. They're kind of grouped together. They batch them all together and make those transactions. Therefore, things can be delayed. With RTP and FedNow, it's per transaction. So the processing, every transaction will be processed independently by itself, much faster, much more efficient. The second part here will be settlement. Like how long does it take these transactions to happen? Now, for those of you in the trading world, you know what T means, right? T is that settlement period. And there's T, T3, which is ridiculous that it takes three days to settle a trade. Come on, let's update our systems, people. You have T2, right? T3, T2, that's your retirement 401k accounts. T1, sometimes for some trading accounts, but most active, especially pattern day traders, you're going to be T0, which means instant settlement. And let's be honest, we are now in 2023 where everything should be instant settlement, should all be recorded on a blockchain, fully transparent, but we see some reluctance on the part of our regulators to get to that point and allowing us all that uh, flexibility and freedom, but we'll get there. The next step on this is gonna be reversibility. So with an ACH, you can actually reverse that transaction. You can possibly see that there might be some problems with that with RTP and FedNow, non-reversible, right? Those are permanent transactions, great. So let me real quickly run through use cases. And I know I'm going rather quick because I'm trying to fit a lot of stuff here into 30 minutes. Um, I'll run through these just so you can see the potential for it because I think many people don't realize how vast, what this is going to impact on a grand scale. So the first use case would be person to person. I'm sending money from me to you. Okay, fine. That's easy. We all, we all get that. Venmo, Zelle, or just regular ATM stuff. Customer to business. So now I might be able to pay for gas. I put popcorn at the baseball game, bridge tolls, or any other business expense can be done directly with the FedNow program, therefore giving us more flexibility as consumers on how to pay for goods and services. I think that's important. How about business to consumer? So now your salaries may be paid directly into that FedNow app. I don't have to no longer wait for direct deposit, which could be cumbersome. We're trying to make it a much faster way for you to receive your payments. Also insurance payouts, company refunds can all be done using the FedNow program, thus taking away a process which may take days to weeks, maybe even months to a matter of seconds. So money is now moving at the speed of light, making it much, I guess, cleaner with regards to doing business transactions. Business to business. So if I'm a business owner and I want to send another business owner money, of course, that's kind of the person to person. So almost the same, but call it B2B. Consumer to consumer. So this one I think would be interesting. You have, you know, payments made to government bodies such as paying your annual taxes, paying the DMV to renew your license. I think I may have, I, let me, there you go. See, to see. And then you have government um, payments made to the government. So tax refunds, that's where the government 
I should say, this should say consumer to uh, government. I apologize. This should say C2G, consumer to government. Next one's G2C, which where the government is now going to be paying you your tax refunds, social security payments, all through that FedNow app. So the goal here on the part of the Fed, and I would say the, the uh, Treasury Department as well, is to make sure that everything is centralized. You can do everything from one app. Therefore, you won't need all these external pieces, which again, I think creates some great investing opportunities. For example, um, if you look at that first one there, person to person, right? A lot of us, me personally, I'm using Zelle. Uh, I use Venmo a lot, uh, PayPal as well. If the system gains some popularity and really starts to do well and becomes the go-to, which it could if used properly and marketed properly, you won't, need a, you won't have the need for a Venmo or a PayPal or a Zelle. And that puts pressure on those businesses, which may present some investing opportunities, not as a buy position, but maybe as a short position and looking to short those specific securities. And we could look at PayPal and Washington Mutual, which is remittances as well. I think it also get hit pretty hard here. <clears throat> now, granted, Washington Mutual has already taken a huge nosedive over the past few years, but I'll look at those charts if we have some time here. So let's real quick talk about the pros and cons of the Fed now. It's an instantaneous transaction network, which is going to benefit you and me, gives us real-time payments, which is fantastic. Another piece, there's two pieces here I think most people aren't looking at. Number one is going to be financial inclusion, meaning that there's people, not just in the U.S., but all around the world that are unbanked. They don't have the ability to open up bank accounts and have access to a financial system. You know, in the U.S., most of us have it, right? We're a developed country, but there are other countries around the world that don't have access to that. And that's one of the uh, allures of cryptocurrency and digital assets is it empowers everyone to be their own bank. So here's an initiative with Fed now to step up and say, okay, hold on a second. We'll make it easier for everybody to have access to money and financial markets. That creates greater financial inclusion. Now, our next piece here is supporting innovation. I think that a lot of a lot of technologies get stifled because the financial system is so rigid and archaic in some senses. What you're now allowing is people to develop faster, more efficient products and services that can be delivered because of FedNow and that payment network. So you'll start to see more businesses come up and modify to the new way that we send money around. You have reduced systemic risk. So Right now, you have the potential for runs on banks. Uh, in theory, you could actually quell that run on the bank. The Fed could do it at their end, right? They could just all of a sudden start to minimize the number of deposits in, or uh, minimize the number of withdrawals or amount you could draw, snap of the fingers, which I know starts to border on big brother and the ability for these central banks to control the access to money, which of course is people's big downside to that. Uh, there's also gonna be big implementation challenges. We don't know exactly how easy this is going to be to implement. You know, why, aren't, why aren't more banks using the RTP system if it was instant? Right? Only a few banks are using it. So there might be some implementation challenges here. Some of the smaller banks may have to spend money on infrastructure and update their systems to accommodate the FedNow program, and that may take some time. And I think that part of the goal of FedNow is actually to help regional banks access these markets and bring them up. But if they don't have the capital outlay to uh, build the infrastructure to adapt to FedNow, may see a problem there. I have this as a con. It says competition with the private sector. So I have this as a con, but personally, I don't think it's a con. I don't really think it's a con. As a trader, this looks like short opportunities for a lot of different securities out there that may be struggling, right? You may look at Washington Mutual, a good example of a stock that is publicly traded. They do remittances, send money all over the world. Well, I can now potentially do that with Fed now. I might be able to do that with digital assets and cryptocurrency. So companies like Washington Mutual and PayPal could feel the pinch here going forward. And again, that creates some opportunities for us as longer term investors or even active traders. Uh, I had security risks and fraud. One of the challenges with cryptocurrency and digital assets is the strength of the smart contract that makes up those networks. And if that is poorly written or the code is bad, then someone could hack it and steal that money. And this is why we've seen such a reluctance on the part of the US government and global governments to be a to implement a central bank digital currency. If it's done incorrectly, it could be an absolute nightmare if hackers and thieves get in there and all of a sudden just start stealing all these digital assets. So they got to make sure it's robust, make sure that there's uh, no security risk or fraud problems or no double spend or other issues like that. And that's why they're taking so long with the central bank digital currency. And the cons here scalability and interoperability. I haven't been able to find information on how this will interact with existing systems or how much it can handle, right? If I start a website and 
you know, I just go to some average run of the mill ISP provider, I may not have the infrastructure to support thousands and thousands of customers accessing that website. If all of a sudden I blow up and Kim Kardashian says my site's the greatest thing in the world, it's going to crash all the time. Well, that's that issue with the FedNow program. If it's utilized that much, what are its boundaries? What are its limitations with regards to consumer usage, right? How many transactions per second can they do? These are a lot of considerations we look at in the digital asset space, like cryptocurrencies. How many transactions per second can Ethereum or Solana or Cardano do? So we get in a sense as to what their potential is for mass adoption. So that's the fed now program and on the surface i know that was a real quick run through only five minutes here to discuss what that fed now program is about you got to understand that this is a, a massive improvement in what we've had before it's much faster it's much more transparent personally i think that this is a very good thing now the dark side of it is that it starts to usher in government control and i know we probably have some libertarians in the room that are going i don't want them looking at what i do this could be one of the downsides of it. Um, there are some concerns that by using the FedNow system, if we become reliant on it, that they would have the ability to censor transactions. So one of my favorite things about decentralized marketplaces or decentralized cryptocurrencies is censorship resistance, right? You, one person can't go and censor. But since you'll be using a system like FedNow, there is the potential for them to limit your access to the money that you have to censor specific transactions, to block specific transactions without your knowing. And you know, to me, that, that creates, a, I guess, a big unknown that makes me uncomfortable with the Fed now. And it's hard to sit there and weigh all the pros and cons to a system like Fed now. Uh, all in all, I like it because I think we should be digital. I think we should have much faster payments. There should be no uh, delayed settlement time. Sending money from one person to the other should be snap of the fingers, instant, not you know three days to send money to my family over in Germany. It's just it's a waste. Of, why? It shouldn't be that way. It's old. So that leads us to the next part, which I think is a very interesting discussion, a logical segue, because in my opinion, there's a stair step up of evolution of our banking system. So you had Real-time payments, that was pretty revolutionary. That was 2017, right? We're only talking six years ago. And that was like, whoa, yeah, real-time settlement. This is amazing. Step one. But that was only credit. I can only send money to somebody. With FedNow, we have the ability to do all sorts of really interesting things. So for example, let's say you have automatic, uh, you have a, a insurance policy with Geico or something like that. You could open up your FedNow, you get an alert from your FedNow app and Geico can send you a request saying, hey, your premium of $500 for the year is due tomorrow. Do you want to pay it? And you go, oh, yeah, I'll click the button. Now, think what this is going to do to people's credit scores. Because a lot of times people have their Geico bill sitting at their house. It's on their desk in their office or pinned to the wall. And like they forget about it. Well, next thing you know, you're, you're three weeks late with your Geico payment. A, your insurance might get canceled. And B, you're now going to ding on your credit report, which drops you down below 720. And now your mortgage rate has to go up because you can't afford a good rate. I'm talking snowball actions here, but that is a real potential is people making late payments. With Fed now, I could literally pick up my phone. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. I got to send that money to my doctor. Here you go. Click, hit the button. Now, they can't force money out of my account, but I can confirm and accept and let them take money out of my account. So I think that's a really interesting way for businesses to get real time settlement and payments of money as opposed to the uncertainty of knowing whether those checks are going to get their checks in the mail. Uh, definitely a big evolution in the way that our markets have been working. Okay, so let's go to the CBDC. Unfortunately, I don't see chats coming through here. I wish I did because I'd love to poll everybody right now. And I would say, how many of you right now are using, if you're watching this, I, I, I'm not seeing any chat. So just uh, just say it to yourself, keep it in your mind because I want you to answer the question of, are you using right now digital dollars, right? In your day-to-day -day life, are you using digital dollars? And I, if I could see the results, I would say that the vast majority of people are going to say, no, no, I'm I'm not, not using digital dollars yet. I don't like that cryptocurrency stuff. I don't use digital dollars. Well, the answer is that 100% of you, every single person watching this right now, is using digital dollars because you're using a system like Visa, MasterCard, American Express, Discover Card, Right? Those are all digital dollars. If you're not physically exchanging a dollar bill or 20 or 100 or whatever it is, then it's going to be a digital dollar. Right? Even a check is really a virtual dollar. I'll call it digital. 
So you are using them on a day-to-day -day basis. And the reason I ask that almost as a trick question is that I want people to start thinking that digital dollars are not the enemy. People feel like, oh, it's, oh, I don't want to do digital. That's, that's crypto garbage. You're using digital dollars every day when you make your transactions. You buy gas, you go to the grocery store, you're paying most likely with credit cards, or you should be to get the points and the rewards. Just make sure you pay your balance in full every month. Uh, if you're using systems like PayPal, uh, Cash App, Venmo, Zelle, all of those are very innovative products that have been around a while. And now the Fed is looking at those saying, you know what? We should update our model to be more like a Venmo or PayPal or Zelle. So that's that evolution that's happening right now. You guys are using digital dollars. Now, what exactly is a CBDC, right? Why is it so important? Every year, there's a budget to, I think it's called the Bureau of Engraving and basically the ones that make the money that actually print and manufacture the coins and the dollar bills and the hundred dollar bills. Every year, there's a budget to that agency. How much do you think it is? What's the budget that you and I as taxpayers spend just to create the money? Don't, don't, don't think about how much money has been created, just the actual physical production costs of all the money. It's just a hair shy. It's like $10 million short of a billion. A billion dollars a year is the budget given to the Bureau of Engraving to make money. Now, I don't know personally whether that is just the manufacture of money, because I'm going to assume that there's also a whole lot of other money spent on the security, the transport, the destruction, because they have to take money out of circulation, shred it, put that money in a landfill and spread it apart so nobody can recompile a shredded dollar bill. That all has costs as well. So my assumption, maybe my naive assumption, would be that it's way more than a billion dollars for us to have a money system with physical currency in the United States. I may be wrong, but I would assume that the system would be much cheaper to manage and administer if it was digital. The reason I say that is because I, in, I teach a cryptocurrency course. I created a cryptocurrency for my students in seven minutes. In seven minutes, I can create a cryptocurrency. Now, could I use that as a global currency for the world? Sure, I could. I'd do a little bit more work than that. But once I have it set up, I only need a team of three or four, maybe five people to manage and make sure everything is running smoothly. There's no issues running the data redundancy sites. I, I could do all that with a very limited staff and therefore saving you and I as taxpayers tens and tens of millions of dollars, probably hundreds of millions of dollars per year. So to ask the question simply, what is a CBDC? A CBDC is a central banked digital currency and it's in the form of a country's fiat. So all it represents is a digital dollar, a digital yen, a digital pound, a digital ruble, you know, you name the country, they're most likely going to have their own CBDCs here in the near future. That said, we already have something similar. We have what are called stable coins in the world. And stable coins are a token that represents a digital dollar. And that's all a CBDC really is. A CBDC is just controlled by the central bank. That's the CB at the beginning. If you want to look at Digital currency, you have USDC, you have Tether, you've got True USD, um, you've got Paxos dollar, right? These are all tokenized dollars. They're digital assets that reflect the value of a US dollar. So we already have them. It's just they're not done on a government wide scale and implementation, but that's going to happen here very, very soon. So let's look at the different types of CBDs just so you understand. A central bank digital currency is going to have a couple different faces to it. There's three main ways that they're going to implement this. And I'll give you my opinion here at the very end. You have what's called an indirect CBDC. That's where your central bank is really in control of everything, but they're not the ones handling your transactions. They leave that to the commercial banks, your JP Morgans, your Wells Fargo, Bank of America. So the current system in place would remain in place. But all the transactions done with those CBDCs or digital dollars would be done from the commercial bank between the consumer as well as between different merchants, right? That's choice number one. The second option here is where the central bank deals directly with the merchants and consumers, essentially cutting out the middleman or the banks. Now, personally, I think that this is going to be the last choice here. Think of how much money is invested in the financial sector. Just pull up the ETF XLF and look at the components. You've got trillions of dollars in big banks. There's no way they're going to sit there and let that just happen, 
right? Oh, just take money. It's fine. Just go. Not going to happen. So I don't believe that this direct method will work. The Fed has already said that they're not going to, but could they, right? The answer is, could they? And the, the answer is absolutely the central bank could create a CBDC and remove all need for physical banks in the future. You would not need a JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, because you're dealing directly with the Fed. Now, remember, the Fed is made up of banks, so I doubt that that's going to happen. And our third choice, which is something rather interesting, and it has been talked about a little bit, it's called a hybrid, or some may call it a synthetic CBDC. What that is, is you still have your central bank, which is controlling everything, and then you have your consumers and your merchants. But the intermediary is not a bank, it's actually the person that controls and administers that CBDC. It's a service provider. And some of you may recognize this name, Ripple. So Ripple in 2017 had an event up in Canada called the Swell event. And Ripple is a digital currency. They're trying to be, they're trying to replace the Swift payment network, which Swift is an old messaging service to send money around the world. Ripple can do it in four seconds, whereas Swift takes days. It's fully transparent. You can send any amount of money at any time, and it's extremely low fees. It's a huge advancement to the way we do things today, but now regulators are going after Ripple, trying to shut them down. So there was talk about Ripple kind of creating the payment network, that CBDC, if you will, for the U.S. markets. Then there was talk about Circle, right? Circle is the one that um, runs the USDC stablecoin, which is backed by Imagine that BlackRock back in USDC, and that may be that intermediary service provider that controls all the money. Personally, I don't think that the government's going to relinquish power. So if I have to choose one of the options on this screen, choice number one is where it's going to be. We're probably going to end up with an indirect CBDC where the central bank makes all the rules, the commercial banks follow the rules, and then you and I deal with the commercial bank when we're sending these digital transactions back and forth. That's most likely what will happen. Um, maybe over the course of history and time, we shift to a direct CBDC and just cut out the intermediary. But uh, for now, don't rock the boat too much. It'll probably be option number one. So let's talk about uh, CBDCs that are fully implemented. And I, I, God, I wish I could see your chat. Right now, how many CBDCs, actually name a country that has a fully implemented CBDC right now that has gone through all the testing and is fully active and implemented right now. R type them on in. The answer is a lot of you are going to put China. A lot of you are going to put Sweden. No. And surprisingly, the first country with a CBDC was the Bahamas. The Bahamas have the Bohemian sand dollar fully implemented digital dollar. Next, you had Nigeria, right? So Nigerian has the E Naira, I don't know if I pronounced that one correctly, but that's they were number two. And Yaman, down south, you know, the Bumbo you know, in Jamaica, decentralized exchange called Jamdex Man. The, how is it that Jamaica, the land of Bob, I, when I think Jamaica, I picture great reggae music, amazing Caribbean food, and joints the size of a baseball bat. And they beat us to the digital currency market. Are you kidding me? We are supposed to be the leader in financial stuff around the world, yet we're dragging our feet. The U.S. doesn't have a CBDC. China does not have an implemented CBDC. I know a lot of you would have typed in a chat there. China has one. No, it's it's in testing phase right now. Now, granted, there's over 300 million people in the current testing phase for their CBDC, but it's not fully implemented yet, and neither is Sweden's. And there's many others out there that are looking to do that. Uh, if you are interested, I have a really cool, let me see if I can bring that one up here, see if I remember where I put it. Um, oh, maybe not. Here it is. Uh, it's a really cool site called cbdctracker.org. I will type that into chat here for anybody who would like to, to see that one. One second here. It goes to everyone. So this um, map is great because it shows you kind of where the efforts are going. Now, who's in? Re we're researching right now, but we've been researching quite a bit. We've got multiple. Project Hamilton just wrapped up, which is an interesting thing as well. Uh, if you click on launched, you notice there's only Nigeria. <laughs> And then you've got Jamaica and the Bahamas over here. Kind of crazy. Some of the smallest dots on the chart are the ones that have actually implemented a CBDC. Kind of, kind of blows my mind. Anyway, that's where we're at. So I thought I would bring it up for a little piece of trivia for you. Um, right now, there's 130 countries representing 98% of the global GDP are exploring CBDCs. They are coming. It's an inevitability, right? It will happen at some point. It's just a matter of when. 
if this is people control, right? When you have the CBDC or a currency that's 100% digital and controlled by the government, it brings in total government control. Uh, 19 of the G20 countries are in advanced stages of CBDC development. So that should tell you right away, we're very close to implementation on some of these major developed countries. So I wanted to bring this one in here just to talk about some of the pros and cons of it. Number one, you're gonna have lower costs, which I think is great. Number two, you've got greater efficiency. So it's gonna be much faster, easier to keep track of all your money. It's all in one place, right? You won't have the need to have seven or eight different banks. Just keep it all in the Fed now. You have greater transparency. Now that's double-edged sword because they now will be able to see all your transactions. I put pros accountability because again, everything will be in one spot, easier to track it and maintain your account balances. Financial disintermediation. You know, you start to create problems, in my opinion, when you start removing things like JP Morgan and, and Chase. So this could be a big problem as far as the implementation and uh, longevity of CBDCs is the disruption it may cause. It's also vulnerable to cyber attacks. You know, having one point of failure, in this case, the Federal Reserve, whoever's managing that CBDC, becomes a focal point for cyber attacks. And I assure you, it will happen. Um, it turns us into a surveillance state as well, because now whoever controls that CBDC will know where you spend all of your money. Every single penny you spend, they know exactly where it goes. And they may start to censor your transactions. Oh, sorry, you got a DUI? Yeah, you can't buy that alcohol. What, what? You made a late payment for something? Well, you can't do this. And they'll start censoring transactions, which is a risk of it. Uh, Brazil, just this week, they found out so Brazil's going through their own central bank digital currency. They posted their code for that central bank digital currency on GitHub, which is a renowned um, code repository. Developers went through and looked at the code and realized that it's written in the code that the Bank of Brazil can go through and censor transactions, block transactions. They can manipulate things at their leisure. Hmm. Now, the good news for Brazil is it's open source, so people know what they're getting. Ours in the US will be closed source and we won't know much at all. So that removes that whole lack of privacy issue. We won't, we won't have lack of privacy, or we won't have privacy. We will have a lack of it. The government will know every single thing that you do. And you look at companies like Apple, Google, Amazon, Facebook, they make billions of dollars a year off of your information. Now, with that CBDC and Fed now, the greatest holder of information will be the federal government. They'll know every single thing about you. And that can be a little bit scary uh, for those who are privacy concerned, more libertarian side of things and, and want to freak out there. So those are very quickly, I know we were flying here, kind of the pros and cons of the Fed now system, looking also at what that might translate as the next step comes in, which is going to be central bank digital currencies. And uh, I will leave it there. I think there's plenty of opportunity. I think that there's going to be some investments, particularly in the cryptocurrency and digital asset space as an alternative to CBDCs. And maybe in 10 years, we don't even have physical money anymore. So that was my presentation for you, the pros and cons of the FedNow program and CBDCs. My name is Merlin Rothfeld. You can always email me at Merlin at OTAHQ if you have any questions. And I don't know if you were going to share some questions with me if some came through. We did have some come through, uh, but Merlin, unfortunately, we're actually out of time today. So I did share that email um, a bit earlier into the chat, but I'm just going to go ahead and paste it again now so that everyone has access. All right. So Merlin, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been such a pleasure to have you on. Do you have any closing notes for our audience? Uh, my closing notes would just be, you know, embrace it. This is not something you can fight. You're not going to fight the Fed. You're not going to fight Fed now. You're not going to fight a CBDC. I would say as with anything, you learn what are the what are the pros and cons of anything in life. You learn to adapt to it and make it work for you as opposed to a detriment to the way that you operate. So uh, learn about Fed now. Learn how it's going to make it easier for you to do your day-to-day -day operations and, you know, prepare for that CBDC. And if there's investments in specific industries, like I was saying, potentially shorting Washington Mutual or PayPal could have some opportunity as well. I think it'll present some investment opportunities. So the future's looking great. I'm glad we're modernizing our financial system and I'm, I'm happy to see what the future holds. Thank you again, Merlin. And to those of you watching, if you ask questions and we were unable to get to them, I did go ahead and replace that email there. It should be at the top of your chat box now so you can go ahead and reach out if you would like to ask those questions. All righty then, everyone, that concludes our time for this session. So to those of you watching, be sure to stay tuned as we do have more in store for you today. I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of your day. Take care.